2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, as we study your word tonight, I ask, Lord, that you would cause us to understand the truth that you have for us, and that we would apply it to our hearts and lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As uh, we continue to study the doctrine of life, we're going to think about a subject that is closely connected with what we looked at last week. And last week we looked at, uh, really, in essence, national defense, the, the role that a nation has in defending its citizen. We considered what we call in theology the just war theory. And now we're going to turn it a bit personal. And we're going to talk about defending ourselves. Self-defense. What does the Bible say about defending ourselves? And I hinted at it last week. I, in about two sentences, summed up what I thought the Bible taught. And then I decided to try and prove that. But as we think about that, I want to begin and end with this. Let's remember, as we talk about this important subject, that there is more to life than the here and now. That there is a life to come. That losing our life here is not the end. In fact, for the believer, it is really the beginning of joy. For the unbeliever, it is really the beginning of suffering. And as I was preparing this and thinking about this, and, and you know, this is a subject, if, if you follow what pastors say online at all, this is a subject that's gotten some publicity of lately. And uh, of lately? Of late. And, you know, we've had these shootings, these, these mass shootings uh, called active shooter events and where people have gone in and, and really they're, they're acts of terror on our home soil. So a lot of us, uh, even though us here have been thinking about self-defense, been thinking about defending ourselves, defending our, our families, taking, taking that seriously. And you have some pastors out there who in many cases of doctrine, many points of doctrine we would agree with, who say things like Christians should never engage in self-defense. And then on another extreme, you have pastors out there saying things like, oh, I hope they come here, we'll show them what we've got. We'll, we'll, we'll teach them a lesson if they come here, wanting the fight. And, and both of those are really extremes. And what we want to do is find what does the Bible say and what is the biblical position? What, what is the, the proper balance? Understanding sort of some of the doctrine we've already considered about the importance of life, the value of life, the, the sanctity of life, understanding that sometimes giving our lives for Christ has an impact that we can't fathom. And I think one of the principal examples of that is in the modern missionary movement, it was five men deciding to not defend themselves, giving their lives in the cause of Christ and in the service to Christ, which led to an explosion of sign-ups for the mission field. And even those who committed that, I'm talking about Jim Elliott. I, I looked up all their names. I can only ever remember Jim Elliott and Nate Saint. There's five. I think there's a Roger, right? There's a Roger. And there's a Steve. How come I can't remember Steve? <laughs> um, but these men uh, that were there with, with the Anka Indians, and, and the, they were dying. But then the gospel, the, that story's not over. The gospel ends up going there. And that sometimes in the cause of Christ, 
Giving our lives is, is a powerful testimony in the service of our Lord. And I, I wanted to remind us of even what we thought about from Romans 2 this morning. That there's a judgment to come. And what we've done with Jesus is the most important question that we face. And it should be our greatest desire for ourselves and for others that they would know the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we hit this topic of self-defense, I want to develop a sort of a, a we had the, the just war theory. I want to develop just self-defense theory. And uh, what, are the, what are the principles that the Bible teaches about it? The first one is found all the way in the beginning of your Bible. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. So our first principle is the principle of protection. Something that I tell my son, Micah, all the time. Is Micah still there? Oh, he, he went to the nursery. All right, so I was going to quiz him, but he got out of the quiz. He knew it was coming. That men protect women. Men protect. I tell Micah, who do you have to protect today? Now, he's a little guy, but he gets the answer right most of the time. His sisters and his mom and his brother. And that, that is a responsibility there. And we see that even here in, in the... Genesis chapter 2, now Richard Phillips, a, a pastor, he's written a book called The Masculine Mandate, uh, an excellent book on, on this subject, and he says that mandate is set forth in Genesis 2, verse 15, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. That here in the creation account, one of the things that God does is he gives Adam, the first man, he gives him a job. And he gives him a job and he gives him commands. A lot of times we think about the command as only being in verse 17, which is to not do something. But in reality, God had actually given Adam many things to do. And here in, in verse 16, that he would, or yes, verse 15, that he was to dress it and to keep the garden. That he, he, God charged Adam with these two tasks, to work and to keep. Now, the term to dress is the term to work, which it means to labor. It, it means to, to labor in the garden. And the term to keep means to be put in charge or to guard. And if you think about the, the, the imagery of being in charge, from time to time, we'll say to one of the older girls, you're in charge of Isaiah now. Don't worry, it's never for very long. Nobody panic. But, you know, the, the idea is we're doing something else. We need to put Isaiah down. We need Isaiah to not eat things he shouldn't eat because he's at that age where he can crawl around and eat stuff. That's about the only thing he can accomplish on his own, put stuff in his mouth. That's how he learns about the world. So we'll, we'll give that. And so they're in charge of Isaiah. And really, that, that's the task of keeping, of protecting, of guarding him against all the dangers that are out there. So at the very beginning of creation, as God charges Adam with what his job will be, it was to work, but then also to keep, to protect, to guard. And so men, we have a duty, particular duty, to protect our families, and we have a right to protect ourselves. Now, I put it that way, that it's a duty when, when my family is, that part of this masculine mandate to work and to provide for my family, but then also to, to protect my family. And that's much more than, um, you know, having a, a weapon or using a weapon, that, that includes things to make sure they're provided for in case something were to happen, and uh, to make sure they're aware of what to do when a fire happens, which I think we should have a fire drill at 1 a.m. Everybody's on board with that, right? Is that a no. good, good idea? No. no. No, it's a bad idea. But anyways, the girls don't want to do it, but I thought it would be fun to see if they know what to do, have the fire alarm go off and make their door or handle hot or whatever, however it works, put some smoke into there, maybe just have a full fire. I shouldn't say that. Um, you know, but, but all of that, that's sort of involved, the, the training, the discipline, making, making them aware and to, uh, to be safe because we have this principle here of protection. And, of course, you, you expand that out to, to positions of leadership, positions of authority. Uh, we have a duty when we're in authority, when we're in a position of, uh, a position of authority, when we are in charge to protect those who are under us. 
So you have, first, the principle of protect, protection. Now, I say it's a right to protect themselves in that, like those five missionaries, it may be something that we don't exercise. And you see this even in the life of the Apostle Paul. He doesn't always claim his Roman citizenship. He claims it, he, he always claims it when his own life was about to be killed in one case. In another case, he claims it when he was about to be set free. Why? To protect those around him. He was concerned for the church in that city, that he wouldn't be put out of the city privately, but instead would be openly acknowledged as having done nothing wrong. So our per first principle is the principle of protection. Secondly is what I'd like to call the principle of knowable danger. That in this role of self-defense, one of the things is um, that our life's in danger. That, that we know our life is in danger. And to see this, turn with me to Exodus chapter 22. Exodus chapter 22. Exodus 22. Verses 1 through 3. Now this is what we call the case law of the Old Testament. So the Lord gave them the Ten Commandments. And then in, in many places he gave some explanation. He gave some cases, some situations. And how to correctly apply the law of God. So look at this. For Exodus chapter 22 verses 1 through 3. If a man steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it. He shall restore five oxen for an ox and four for sheep for a sheep. If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall be no blood shed for him. If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. So I want you to notice the context here. It's very important. The context is of penalties to a thief. This is somebody who has come to take particularly an ox or a sheep, somebody who's, a, who's coming in to steal the cattle. So this isn't an attacker coming in, but somebody who's come in to steal possessions. And if that one, verse 2, is found breaking in at night, there's no guilt if he dies. If their thief is breaking, it says breaking up, the idea of breaking in, uh, if, he's, if that's at night and he's struck so that he dies... There's no bloodshed. There's no guilt for the death. The person who is defending his home is not uh, responsible for murder. And that act of self-defense. Now, this is a, an important passage. It clearly teaches this principle of self-defense. Now, verse 3 changes things a little bit. It says, if he's breaking in during the day, and that's the idea, if the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him. That in the day, when you could see and know what's going on, if that person who's breaking in, if their blood has been shed, then uh, there is guilt for them. If they are killed, then uh, it is considered a murder. Now, why is that? What's, what's the context? What's, what's going on here? And I want you to remember, this is important, that it's not an attacker, but a thief. Uh, there used to be this show... Uh, it may still be on there, but we don't have cable anymore. It Takes a Thief that was the name of it. And it was a show about uh, they would go to these houses and they would ask them if their thief could break in and try and steal stuff. And it was to illustrate how unsecure all of our places are and they'd set up cameras and stuff and he'd go in and smash things. But one of the fascinating things is a thief wants to get in and get out as quick as possible. So if you have a safe, you know what a thief does? He takes it with him. It's you just put a big target on your safe. So load it up with things you don't want, your trash that want to go out, uh, <laughs> and uh, just leave it right there in your bedroom. I think it was John recently told me somebody broke into their house and just went to the master bedroom. Ignored the boys' room that had cash laid out because they want to get in and get out. They're, they don't want to interact with you at all. They're looking for uh, easy targets. And so in this case, it's not an attacker, which would be a different category. We have that right of self-defense. And... It's a thief, but at night, when you can't see, his intentions are not known. You, can, you can't see, and, and so uh, he's breaking in, and you're going to go on the assumption to protect your family and smite him, and, and you're, you're, not, you're not held responsible for his murder. But during the day, it's more obvious what he's doing. 
And so he's not, he's not attacking me, he's trying to, to steal something. And so there's, there's that principle there. Now, what's fascinating about this uh, is this is uh, something that's carried right over into our own laws here in, in the state of Florida. The concealed carry laws and the stand your ground laws. If you feel like your life is threatened, you have the right of, of self-defense. It's not murder. Now, if, if somebody is running away with you with your stuff, that's a different category. If, if your life is not threatened, it, it's a different uh, category of, of crime at that point. And so the, the principle here is that our lives are in danger. And when our lives are in danger, when there's that knowable danger, we can take steps to protect ourselves. Now, this one, and, and these aren't in any particular order, but this third one, I believe, is very important as sort of the counterbalance to this. And that's the seriousness of life. The principle, I'm going to call it the principle of no hate. We're here in Exodus. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13 says, Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not murder. Now, even in the law of God, in the law of God that he gave to Israel, there were some crimes that were worthy of death. So thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder, doesn't mean the state doesn't uh, have the right of capital punishment. Romans chapter 13 makes that case too. They do not bear the sword in vain. What's in view here in Exodus 20 verse 13 is uh, killing someone out of hatred, taking vengeance into our own hands, uh, a vigilante approach to things which would be against the law of God. We're going to turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 19 to see how serious is life and our role to protect it. Now, Deuteronomy 19, we're going to look specifically at verses 4 through 7, but this is the law relating to accidental murder. Verse 4 says, or verses 1 through 3 are about the city of refuge, Verse 5, as when a man goeth into the wood with his neighbor to hew wood, and his hand fetcheth a stroke with the axe to cut down the tree, and the head slips from the axe and lighteth upon his neighbor that he die, he shall flee into one of these cities and live. So the context of verse 5 is, is really handling a dangerous weapon. Uh, it is a dangerous thing to go cut down a tree. Uh, trees are heavy. They fall down. They can do lots of damage. Uh, and the axe head, in this particular case, as he was going to cut down the tree, the axe head flies off. Now, he didn't intend for the axe head to fly off. This was an accident. But uh, there, there's a certain responsibility whenever we're handling a deadly weapon. You need to check the axe head. I remember my dad had an, had an axe. And he was trying to, he wasn't chopping down a tree, but he was trying to, chop up a stump for some reason. And he swung it four or five times and then he checked and the axe head was about to fly off. And so he had to, he had to fix it, knock it down. Apparently this happens. And then he went back to swinging, but he wouldn't let me be outside anymore. He said I had to go inside. He wouldn't let us stand behind him or in front of him while he, he cut the axe. My, my dad was a very cautious individual, never let us jump off the roof or anything fun. But we understand that handling a deadly weapon, that we have to handle it with care. Now, you may not realize this, but most of us in the room handle a deadly weapon on a daily basis. You know what it is? Yeah, you guys, you guys have taught teenagers to drive, haven't you? <laughs> so what my mom told me, this is a deadly weapon. And you have to be serious, and you have to uh, be careful with the handling of that, and be aware of that. And this one, they weren't subject to death, but they had to flee to the city of refuge. That if they were found outside the city of refuge, that there was a punishment. But there was a requirement. The requirement was there had been no hatred in the past. Verse 6. Lest the avenger of blood pursue the slayer while his heart is hot and overtake him because the way is long and slay him. Whereas he is not worthy of death insomuch as he hated him not in time past. That in order for him to uh, go to the city of refuge and stay in the city of refuge, and for this to be classified as an accidental murder, there was this requirement of no hatred 
in the past. Now, he hasn't changed the law of God as Moses gives us this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He hasn't changed the situation. It's still an accidental thing that's happened. But the requirement is that there was not a history of hate or enmity between them. Verse 11 says, But if any man hate his neighbor and lie in wait for him and rise up against him and smite him mortally that he die and flee into one of these cities, the cities of refuge, then the elders of his city shall send and fetch him hence and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. Thy eye shall not pity him, but thou shalt put away the guilt of the innocent blood from Israel that it may go well with thee. So here again, now in this case, there's a little bit more preparation that's gone into it. He's lied in wait and he's mortally wounded. Uh, this one that he hated he might say, look, it was just, I didn't mean to kill him. I was just trying to uh, maim him. I was just trying to, to give him a bruise. But the man died. And there's a responsibility. And we see in that the seriousness of life. The seriousness, the value of life. Our duty to protect life. There's still a consequence, even for the accidental death. Even when there's no hatred in the past, there was still a consequence. He had to go live in the city of refuge. Had to leave his life behind. He had to go to the city of refuge. He had to stay there until the death of the high priest. Well, how long does that take? It depends on how old the high priest is. It, it, it was something the, the, the Lord gave. And even in that consequence, we see that our actions, even, even accidental things, have an impact. That when handling uh, an axe head or an actual weapon, we have to do so with care. You know, it's interesting, as uh, I've been studying self-defense for my own benefit, for my family, and uh, studying various things, they say, they say, if you're prone to road rage, if you're prone to road rage, do not carry a weapon. If you're prone to anger, don't carry a weapon. It's, it's one of the, the very... Top things that they, they say. Because hate <coughs> leads to murder. Hate is the seed which, when given time, blossoms into killing and murder. And the, the need for self-control uh, in uh, the, these things. And we see it very seriously. Now, our third principle, I think it's our third principle, I didn't number them on my screen, is the, the role of training and preparation. Well, what I'd like to call the principle of competence. Now, 1 Samuel 17, what, what story is that? Oh, I thought you'd know off the top of your heads. You will once we turn there. It's the story of David and... I hope so. Yeah, I got the reference right. You guys made me worry there for a second. The story of David and Goliath. And you know how this story unfolds. The, the armies of God were aligned against the armies of uh, the heathen. And Goliath came out day by day to challenge the champion of the people of Israel. And say, let's have a contest. Let's make this simple. You and I fight. And the winner is, is the victor. Uh, the, the loser will have to serve the winner. And, and the people are terrified. And along, along comes... David, been, he's been sent by his father to take some supplies and some encouragement to his brothers. He's there. He hears the challenge. And he wants to fight. Now, you, you think about this. It's, it's kind of like, you know, if, if, uh, when Josie says, uh, can I cook dinner tonight? And you think, oh, that's nice, Josie. No, you cannot cook dinner. Here's, here's a very easy, safe task uh, for you. You're, you're not ready for that. When I picture David, I often picture him as a very little kid. But that's not the situation, is it? As, as he goes to, to Saul and he, he applies for the position of champion, he appeals to certain things. Verses 33 through 36. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. For I went after him, and smote him, and delivered him out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. 
Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. So David's first point is, I've done this before. I have experience in uh, this area of, of warfare. I fought uh, a lion and a bear. That seems to be a pretty good resume. Anybody fought a lion or a bear? Any grizzlies out there in Alaska, Tim? You fought a few? Oh, I, was, so I want to hear that story later. Maybe when mom's not around, though. But, uh, um, you know, he, he had this experience. He, he, had, he had done this. He was, uh, a, a, as the shepherd of the sheep, he was in charge to keep and to, to guard the sheep. I remember at camp, uh, when I was a camper, Pastor Jim taught on this, and he said that he, he always imagined uh, that out in the fields there in Israel, there's a bunch of tree stumps filled with rocks. Where David would take his, his sling and he would practice. He would practice and he would practice and he would practice. And he was very, very competent with that, that, that he had experience. That it wasn't just him saying, yeah, I think I can do this. God will magically make it happen. It'll, it'll just be a miracle that I win. No, he says, I have done, I have practiced, I have skills in this area of, of self-defense. Verses 38 through 40. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head, and also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand, and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. And put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a script, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the second principle here is tested weapons. I mean, here's Saul saying, well, okay, you're going to go. I, this is a great idea. Let's give you the best armor and sword that I possibly can. Now, we, we read in the Bible, Saul was kind of a tall individual and uh, was, was a grown man. Here's David, a youth. Uh, I, I always picture him really clumsy, looking like when Micah puts on my shoes. And, you know, I, I don't know if it was that bad. It, it certainly Saul wouldn't send him out foolishly. But that wasn't David's point. He, he just said, look, I, haven't, I don't you know these. I haven't used these. I haven't, I haven't tested these. I don't have the skill with these. And so I am going to use what I know, what I have practiced with, what I have tested, what I have used in the past, the, the principle of he had competence with the weapons that he would use. He had experience, he had this uh, trust in the weapons. And, you know, some think that uh, the reason he took the five smooth stones with him is that Goliath had some brothers. Not that he thought he would miss the first one, but that Goliath had some brothers, and so he might have needed some more ammo if that was the case. Now, both of these are important. The, the principle of competence, the principle of, uh, I think I said this last week, or maybe I said it privately to someone, you know, just carrying around a weapon doesn't make you safe. In fact, if you don't know how to use it, it, it doesn't mean anything. In fact, it could mean that it could be used against you if you're not prepared and ready and, and trained in these areas. And as David goes, though, and, and, and he goes with this, he goes and he has a humble reliance upon God. Verse 45, then, or... Verse 44, And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, Thou cometh to me with the sword, and with the spear, and with the shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hands, and I will smite thee, and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the hosts of Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. As David goes to fight, and as he stands before Goliath, he doesn't start talking about the lion and the bear. He doesn't talk about the fact that he has come with weapons he knows how to use. Those are important preparations. But he comes and says, I come before you in the name of the living God. That I, I recognize that it was my duty to prepare, and I am prepared as much as I can. But ultimately, my trust and my hope is in the name of the Lord. My confidence is in the name of the Lord. That the watchmen 
He watches the city in vain if the Lord doesn't keep the city. Now that doesn't mean the watchman can go to sleep. But it means that he has to trust and rely upon the Lord. As you know, we think about we, the, the picture is we live in a very dangerous time. There's a lot of statistics that actually contradict that. Certain crimes are low. You know, we always worry about abductions with children. It's actually very low. But we, we live in what we perceive to be dangerous times. We want to take steps to be wise and protect ourselves. But ultimately, our hope, our trust, our confidence is in the Lord. And we pray that the Lord would keep the house. The Lord would keep our children. The Lord would keep our families. That the Lord would, would keep us safe. Now, out of everything in this lesson, this has the most clear applications to the spiritual warfare that we're in. That as we think about doing battle spiritually, as we, we think about standing for Christ in the workplace, or standing for Christ in the neighborhood, or standing for Christ in uh, interaction with people in the grocery store, this has direct application. One of the number one reasons people give for not sharing their testimony, for not giving the gospel, do you know what it is? I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Part of that is because we overcomplicate things. And if, if we're going to be prepared for that spiritual battle, well, first we need previous experience. Do you know the Lord? Do you love the Lord? What has the Lord done for you? You can tell somebody about that. You know, you are probably the foremost expert in you. And I don't mean that, I don't mean that arrogantly, but you know what's happened to you. And, uh, and so you can share, what has God done in my life? God saved me from my sins. I, I'm a sinner. And, and sharing a, a personal testimony like that. We need to be trained and tested with the weapons. And the weapon that, of our spiritual warfare is the Word of God. We need to be skilled in the Word of God. We need to have used it in times past. And, and to learn from it. And then, of course, finally, as we serve the Lord, we need a humble reliance on Him. Yes, we, we plant. We water. We do some weeding along the way but it is God that gives the increase and, and it's fascinating having studied uh, self defense the spiritual warfare imagery really rings, uh, it makes more sense to me that, that, that we are in a spiritual battle and when I've heard uh, Mr. McMillan tell some stories here, Pastor Yoon tells stories at, at the battle, he says look in warfare you either kill or be killed and uh, having grown up in, in great safety, uh, that, that's something that we need to be reminded. Spiritual warfare. Or, and we take the sword of the Spirit and we use it. But we have to be prepared. I think too often we think, well, I'll, I'll get serious about serving the Lord when I get an opportunity to serve the Lord. When I just, I just will magically happen to us. But it doesn't work that way. The Lord is preparing us for what lies ahead. He's working in our hearts and lives. And as we do battle spiritually, we must be trained and tested in the word of God, a reliance upon him. The last principle is the principle of eternal life. That as, as we think about these things, a balance point for us is that ultimately we're not living for this world. We're living for the world to come. So remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 8. I'm going to end with this verse of scripture. Verses 34 through 38. And when he had called the people unto him, with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus says that whoever will save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. That we are seeking the glory of Christ. We're seeking a testimony of service to him. And that ultimately, 
This world is not our home, but it is eternity to come with the Lord Jesus Christ. So may we live in light of eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the many practical things your word teaches us. And we pray, Father, that we would grow in grace and knowledge of your word, that we'd grow in skill, that as we engage in the spiritual battle that's all around us, that, Father, we would do so with the word of God, with your word, with the sword of the spirit, uh, with reliance upon you. And, Father, make us wise in this generation, in this time in which we live. May we take those uh, important steps to, to safeguard ourselves and our families. But ultimately, Father, cause us to never trust in ourselves, but to trust in you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.